it's like, what? Amazing. No, there is no joke. But hi, everyone. Carrie O'Shea Gorgon on the Backpack Show. And I'm disappointed to say that Chris is having some internet problems right now. So when he comes back, we may or may not put him back in the feed. It all depends how he sounds. But I did not want to deprive you of the opportunity to talk with Lual Mayan, who runs Janub Games, because he is amazing. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for, for welcoming me. This is really amazing. I'm really, I'm really super excited to be here today. Yeah. I'm so excited <laughs> to have you with us. Now, I would yeah. normally say that you are... Yeah. self-made man but you don't say that i don't a lot uh because like there is there's 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 so much to that there's so much to being a self-made person there's so much to uh because like a lot of people always ask me like you know you're in dc right now you make video game and uh, are you a self-made person i'm like you know i could but sometime you know the day my mother bought for me a computer in the refugee camp was the day that disqualified me to become a self-made person because there's somebody that invested in me. That there's somebody that actually look at me and behold a little bit what I'm doing right now. And, and that's why I say so. Yeah. Well, let's kick off the show and we'll talk about it. Yeah. Backpack show. Now, Luwal, you had told your mother that you wanted a computer, but nobody knows anything about what happened before that. Like, where were you living at the time? Anything about your situation, your upbringing, why that was such a remarkable request? Yeah. So, like, my name is Luwal Main, and I'm from South Sudan. And uh, my family had to flee the country because of the war, because of the civil war. So when my family fled to South Sudan, they had to go to northern Uganda to find a place of refuge. So during on the journey, I was born on the way as my family was actually uh, almost reaching to, to the refugee camp. So refugee camp became like a place where I can actually live my life. I've lived there for like 22 years. And uh, it, it wasn't an easy moment for us, you know, as, um, as somebody, as a child that was growing up in a refugee camp, uh, it wasn't easy. Like every, every single day we wake up, the only thing we think about is to survive. The only thing we need to think about is to eat food, have clean water, medicine. It wasn't an easy journey, you know, and also thinking about like people back home and things like that, it wasn't like an easy journey for us. A lot of people think that, you know, living in a refugee camp is a temporary thing, but it's, you know, it's not, you know, it's something that everybody is there every single day. So it's, it's, it's not an easy journey for us, yeah. So you say it's a journey for you. And now I'm thinking about how did you even, how was it that you aspired to have a computer? What was life like on a daily basis? And then once you finally got the computer, how did you make it all work? Like, <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So like the first time I saw a computer in my life was 2007. It was like a refugee registration. So when I went there and I looked, people were using computers, you know, people were using laptop and I was like, wow, what is that? You know, that moment I was like, yeah, I, I, I even didn't know, like, what does it take for somebody to use a computer? But from there, like, I knew that, like, I'm not, I'm, I'm never going to have it any day because, like, of the situation that we were in, in the refugee camp. But in 2010, I came to my mother and I was like, yo, like, I, I want to buy a computer. And she was, she was laughing at me like, wow, like, what are you going to do with the computer? Where are you going to charge it? Where are you going to, like, uh, where, w w there's no school, you know, who's going to train you, all those things. And and to me, I didn't even say anything. I thought I was just asking something crazy. And because she was a mother to me, she like wait for like th three years looking for $300 to buy for me a computer. So, and then one day she came and like, she was like, this is the money, you can go and buy a computer. That moment, you know, changed my life. That moment was, I was like, wow. And then I was actually thinking now I have a computer. Am I just going to skip it in the house like in, as a museum? Because I, I, I don't have any place where I can be able to charge it and something like that. You couldn't charge it. Yeah, there's, there's no power. There's no thing like that. But because like, you, you know, because I really had the passion about it. I asked for my mom and she worked so hard. It took them like, like 250 miles to flee the country to find a place of refuge. And to me, like I was born on the way. So I was just thinking about this and, and thinking about like if my mother can make it, you know, through that journey. And also she sacrificed everything for her to buy for me a computer in a refugee camp. I became like the only child in a refugee camp that had a computer. Like it, there was nobody, you know, like, and uh, it, it, was, it wasn't an easy journey for us. 
So, and I remember like I, I when I she bought for me a computer, I was like, what is next now? Like, what can I do? Am I just gonna keep it in the house? Uh, you know, am I just gonna like, what am I gonna be doing? So then I, I found a place where I can charge my computer. And that place was like a, a center for like for the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. So I would walk there three hours every day to go and charge my computer. And three hours back. And three hours. It was, it was just, it was just like, but for me, I enjoyed it. You know, like that was the only thing, like I was, I was happy with it because like that, that was the only thing that I had. I couldn't think of anything better than that. Now it would be hard for somebody who's never had or used or seen a computer hmm. just to learn the basic things on, off, open, close, that sort of thing, right? That's hard hmm. if you don't know. And then uh, some people, they would want to learn something like, you know, office, mm -hmm. <laughs> how to use a word program or, you know, maybe uh, make a spreadsheet or something. But you thought, I think I want to make video games. Like that's a jump, right? Like that's not the easy next step after turning it on. Yeah, it wasn't easy. Even for me to learn, like for me to learn how to code was so hard. Like it, it was like one thing I, I had to realize is one is the first time I saw a video game, you know, I remember my friend, my friend like installed for me a video game called uh, Grand Theft Auto. So I opened my computer, <laughs> I opened my computer and I look, I, I saw the icon, I was like, wow, what are these? I thought like video game, uh, like are not made by people. I thought they, they fall from heaven, stuff like that, because I never thought anybody like doing them. But for me, like when I start playing video game, when I, when I start playing uh, Grand Theft Auto, my first reaction was not like, wow, this is fun. Uh, it was not, wow. I was like, wow, games are so powerful. And, uh, and, and when I look at my experience and the thing that I've been through, you know, video game are not like, you know, are not like movies where you sit on a couch and then watch. When you play a video game, you're making, you're interacting, you're making decisions. And, and that process, when I was in the refugee camp, I realized that, wow, you know, I'm from a country that has been ripped by a civil war. Yeah. And, 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 and if kids can be able to play a game that can help them, you know, I took that upon me to be able to say, wow, these, these games are amazing. How, how about I create a game for conflict resolution, game for peace building? So like that whole idea, because that was my experience, because I believe that, you know, we use our past and experiences to create a sustainable future for other people. And that actually what really inspired me to just jump from like, you know, just knowing nothing and then to start like creating video game because I first found my purpose when I'm creating game. So you uh, decided to make a game that's yeah. called Salam for whichever yeah. reason my screen is yeah. not loading. Yeah. And Salam part of, you know, the word for peace. Yeah. Um, and everybody's really excited about this. It's it's mm. still on the way to to being handled. What, yeah. What's your what's your time frame for this? And can you talk to people about what the gameplay is like inside of Salam? Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, so we are uh, we are currently working right now on Salam. Salam is um, it's a it's a high tension runner game that put a player in the shoes of a refugee. So your main focus as uh, as a player is you take a refugee from a war torn country to a peaceful environment. So and and on the way, you know, like for our main focus is people to understand the journey of a refugee, what it takes them to become actually a refugee. So like with my with my journey, the time I became a refugee was a time when I was happy. I did not even think about anything, you know, and I didn't, I don't even care like what other people make of refugees. Some people meet me today and they're like, yo, were you a refugee? I was like, yeah, I was a refugee, but they can't believe it. But they don't understand the journey that I've been through. And, 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 and this game, we are looking at a way we put players to understand that, is there a role that you can play in this journey? It's, it's, it's about empathy. It's about teaching people what it takes. So as, as it is a, a high stension run a game, you're taking your refugee, there are a lot of challenges, you know, water. You need to get water for your character to run. You need to get food for your character to have the energy to run. You need to like heal them when they are like hard on the way. So like those all experiences are in the game and that's how you actually like get to interact with the game. And we have a very cool uh, feature in the game whereby like, when you buy food in the game, actually you're actually buying somebody in a refugee camp food. When you're buying water, you're actually buying water in for somebody in the refugee. So like it's- right, it's, it's not just much, gameplay. Yeah, it's more than that. It's, it's trying to connect people and trying for them to understand really what role can they play in the world. So they're buying food in the game, but they're yeah. actually buying food for a real person. For a refugee. Yeah. Yeah. And the main character is based on your mother, is that right? Yeah, the main character is based on my mother. You know, she is her own, is our journey, you know, and she, she's someone that really helped me to get me where I am today, yeah. Laurie Davis is a teacher. She says she wants to use this with her students. 
That would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that would be really cool. Yeah. Now you're based right now out of, I think, Washington, DC. Yeah. How long have you been in the States? And what was that like, you know, from refugee camp to another displacement place and now to the States? What's that been like for you? Unbelievable. Uh, so um, I've been in the in America for like uh, two, three years now. Okay. Uh, since I uh, since I came from the refugee camp, it's it's been a lot of changes. I, I believe that like every environment has different changes. Uh, you get to meet new people. You get to meet you know new friends. You get to have like new challenges. When I was in a refugee camp, there are a lot of things that I enjoy. You know, um, a lot of people. You know, when they look at my pictures back then, you know, I'm happy every day. You know. And uh, because that was the only life that I knew, you know, my, my mind was not up to like, wow, I'm going to be in America, you know, I'm going to be somewhere. Like even when I started my first game, my focus was not to make a game to sell. My focus was not a game to like make a big, like to come to the U.S. I was just make, creating something that kids in the refugee camp can use. As a, as a creator, I believe that I can be able to create an environment where somebody is going to live their life for the rest of their life because it's it's, it's a game plan and stuff like that. So there are things that I really like. One thing that I enjoy a lot when I was in a refugee camp and I love talking about it a lot is the community. You know, people are always together. People are always happy together. People are always crying together. You know, when something comes, it's everybody. That's one thing that I missed. You know, in America, I'm, I live in a huge, I live in a huge apartment. I even don't know my neighbor. <laughs> Right. So like yeah, like I don't know, like all those things. And we go to a lot of effort to not know our neighbors. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in a refugee camp, like you know everybody, like everybody there, you know them, you know, like you know, stuff like that. And and that that's humanity. That's that's something that really it creates that sense of like even even in lifeline, you know, like you you always with people, people are suffering, but again, you have that community to keep people together always. Yeah. Speaking of community, our community loves you. John says, thank you, Luang, for sharing your experience in game form. What yeah, a vision. Carol says, truly amazing. Carol's checking in from Canada. Chloe uh, from Scotland says, it's so beautiful. You're wonderful and so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, my, my family is now in Canada. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. So, they've, they've been there for like about a year now. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you to correct a misperception. A lot of people yeah. think refugee camps are like temporary shelters and that you stay there only a little while, but you mm. live for quite a long time there. Yeah. I've been there for like 22 years. My family have been there for like 25 years. Uh, both of my brothers were born there. So, like, and it's, it's a life for them. You know, we just have this whole idea of like, you know, these people are going to be there for five years. You know, nobody wake up in the morning and just leave what they love to go and suffer with their children. You know, when when my family had to flee the country, I lost two of my sisters on the way because of the war. And uh, they, they were farmers, you know, they were like keto keepers, you know, they, they love their life. So and, and, and they can't just do that because like they want to go somewhere, you know, no, like these places. Refugees do not deserve to live there, but because like they, it's, it's a decision of life and death, you know, you either flee or be, a lot of people are di displayed with different th things. But like, especially with my family, that was like, because it's a war, you know, it's, it's, it's a displacement. It's like a lot of people, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy. So refugee camp, and, and that's one thing I always tell people, like even my family, like they have lived there, we try to like move to come to America from for like for like 20 years and we have been rejected for 10 times you know it's 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 not an easy thing you know the settlement is not an easy thing so for me and that's one thing like i had to realize i was like wow now i'm not going anywhere you know i'm just gonna you know utilize all the resources that i have here being content you know i was content with what i was having in a refugee camp you know i was happy with it and that what helped me to like put all my effort to work yeah and you have your own company now. So this isn't a company you work at. Janub Games is your company. Yeah, Janub Games is now my company. We are based in DC and uh, we have like real amazing partners. And uh, like, you know, we um, um, my, my plan now, you know, my dream is we're going to expand it, you know, have more have more employees, you know, just working hard and, 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 and tell the world that, you know, as refugees, we are not a burden to the society, you know, we just and we just don't want to hang out, you know, we need opportunities, you know, to just do whatever we can, you know. And you're doing good mm. with your games, like you are with Salam. Yeah, and and, and and that's my focus, you know, there's there's so much we can do, you know, uh, in the world. I know a lot, I know a lot of people are watching right now, but like everybody, you know, we can, 
be a change we want in the world, you know, in, in, in so many ways. Uh, I'm actually launching my foundation, uh, I think, by the end of this month. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, everybody will want in on that. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of comments. Luol Mayo, can you stick around? Uh, we come back and do a little panel at the end of this. So if yeah. you can stay, uh, we'll, we'll bring you backstage. But stick yeah. around. Don't run off just yet if you can help. Uh, uh, <laughs> so thank you, Luol. Um, wow, look at this. What an incredible lesson to use what you have. Be content with it and make the most of it. Wow. Yeah, a lot of good feelings coming out of that. So, And uh, that was um, Carol Alaloof recommended uh, we talked to a while. She said, you know, this is a pretty cool story. This is the sort of stuff you like to cover on the backpack. And I was like, well, okay. Like I never expect that I'm going to enjoy a story. And then I was smitten. He's just, Oh, really I love it. You get to fall in love every day. Smart guy. So good. So Fozzie is here. I, you know, by the I way, sorry, I was a little late. The uh, Comcast business decided this would be a perfectly good time. 10 AM Eastern Hi, to just dis uh, wreck business. You know, that was good. Thanks, Comcast. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get out of that. I'm going to talk about sponsors. I'm not going to cry as much as I have been in the last Aww. minute. I'll be okay. <clears throat> okay. We're sponsored by StreamYard. You can make a, a show just like this. You can talk to your own friends who are refugees who end up opening big companies in D.C. And, and you doing social to, good. And doing all kinds of social good. And, you know, all on your own channel, damn it. Seabrogan.me slash StreamYard. Make your own show. It's so easy. It's ridiculously easy. I had this thing running off my phone, barely. Uh, and you know, still worked, but so StreamYard. Hey, authors, your dumb book's not going to sell itself. I'm sorry, <laughs> anybody else thinking Luol needs to write a book? <laughs> think it's going to happen. It has Luol's to. going to write a book. You know, he's going to write a book. He's already when mastered you... English in his spare time. He's got to write a book. Where do you put it? Do you think? You need a website to promote it, so you should go to PubSite, pub-site.com. And if you're an author, you've got the book, you just need the website, they can even build it for you. It's super easy to do it yourself, but if you don't want to, they can build it for you. And there's a two-week free trial, but after that, it's just $19.99 a month, and they can build you the perfect website to promote yourself, to promote your book. Go to pub-site.com. Powered by FSB Associates, 25 years making authors look way better than they really are on their own. Stop it. The authors are wonderful. <laughs> Author make... Len Joy is here no, today. No, but... so FSB Associates chooses great authors who are also fascinating, interesting, and wonderful people. And that is the secret to their success because it's really quality content. The authors are good and interesting people. So when they publicize them, it works. And so obviously they know what you need in a website or so pub site pub com, and they are also a sponsor of our person of the day a little bit later so we'll get to that yes now i haven't talked on screen with my friend mark horvath for i don't even know anymore it's far too long i know for sure i haven't hugged him in person for uh, probably three to five years i was gonna it's, say at least six months <laughs> yeah well definitely at least six, six months, months. But maybe three Awful. to five years last time i saw him he had this really cool preacher hair going um, it was like crazy long, uh, and now it's back to reasonably manageable. So, like the shepherd and Firefly. Yeah, like the shepherd. How you doing, Mark? I am doing great. And I had uh, what I've learned about COVID hair is COVID hair always looks bad. So you're consistent, but when you go short, there's like good and bad hair days. Oh. So you know, it's the worst thing in the world: good and bad hair days. <laughs> Listen, you run Invisible People, and this is a project that I met you in 08, I think, at uh, Gnome Dex, Blessed Soul and Rested Soul. Um, and you were telling me that you were changing the face of what people think when they look at, at homeless people. And you wanted to change the narrative up. And you have been doing that steadily for so many years at this point. How many? 12, 13? Where are we? We started uh, November 2008. Wow. And so there it is. And so you do something that's on the surface, not that tricky. You go and you talk to homeless people, except there's a whole bunch of parts of that. One, you got to do it in a way that the production value makes people actually want to stick around. Two, you have to keep the narrative interesting enough that people want to be educated and entertained and learn about homelessness. And three, you have to earn the trust of a community of people who have been kicked so many times, they're probably not quite yeah. ready to stay trusting. Well, um, what happened and, you know, as they say, uh, necessity breeds innovation. 
Uh, I lost everything in the 08 crash and I was homeless a long time ago, rebuilt my life, three bedroom house, 08, lost everything. And I want to tell you, I started invisible people because I wanted to change the world. But the truth is I needed purpose to get up in the morning. And that's how I started it. Now we fast forward to today. We are doing the first person storytelling that you've seen. Uh, we do mini documentaries. Uh, this year we produced eight um, that focus on both the problems and solutions. Uh, we now have 38 writers, 17 are full-time, six of them are homeless, five of them are formerly homeless, and we post news on homelessness every day on Apple News and Google News. Um, and we have the only space online for young adults to learn about homelessness that is not spun for a political or fundraising agenda. It's a place for them to go and learn and do homework or whatever. And last but far from least, we have a robust advocacy platform. So if you're in the United States, you can contact your legislators, both state and federal, to say, hey, we got to do something about this affordable housing crisis or homelessness is going to continue to get worse. John and also Chris's mom would like a book from Luol. I just want to cut in and say that. Mark, when I first met you, you had just completed a tour where you drove around the country and interviewed homeless people and you gave them socks when you would go and talk to them. And I don't think like a lot of people who haven't put you know a lot of thought into what homeless situations are like, what it's like to be homeless. I had no idea that giving them socks yeah. was preferable to even say giving them money or something. Can you talk to me about that? Sure. Um, ironically or interesting or however you want to phrase it, this would have been the 10th year road trip anniversary. And we had a deal with a major brand to go travel around the country this year. And then this pandemic hit and everything changed, including that brand deal. But I was really excited to be going around and meeting everybody and, you know, uh, using uh, influence to amplify the story. Um, I am, I can't say I'm the first person that gave out socks, but I'm one of the first. Now it's common. Now you have brands that do sock giveaways as part of their cause marketing. Um, underwear is number one. And um, for obvious That's tricky reasons, though, Mark, because sizing. Right, logistically, you, know, you can't like, put... See. Exactly. <laughs> you like. Logistically, <laughs> yeah. can't put everything in a backpack for all the different people. So socks, uh, when I first started, and Today, lots of people give out sandwiches. And uh, in many urban communities prior to the pandemic, there's actual overfeeding. Um, so socks was something that nobody else was doing. And you could really have this nonverbal communication with a homeless person is, oh, you're not handing me a sandwich. You actually know about homelessness. You're handing something I can really use, socks. And then uh, back then, I used to get my socks from bowling alleys in, in California. So bowling alleys have to have, you know, you have to wear shoes and people show up with flip flops. Mm -hmm. So they have these socks and then they just, you know, when you're done, they throw them in a bag and I would pick up garbage bags full of socks. And wow. then there's this guy named Chris Brogan who connected me to this brand name Hanes uh, and said, you know what, you guys gotta, gotta work with these, these, this Hanes guy. So now I think we've given away, uh, over 3 million pairs of socks and we just did a 1 million mask campaign, uh, because of the homelessness. But before I, I really have to stress as a nonprofit or a brand, what's important to me is education. When I connect to a brand, it has to have an educational component. Um, the mask campaign with Haynes was about wearing a mask. Uh, we shipped three smartphones to three homeless people a couple of years ago and did a day in their life on Instagram stories, uh, which has never been done before. Um, and it was brilliant. And Haynes used their, you know, ad spend and their, their PR might uh, and we reach 15 million kids, educating them on homelessness. And most of us, whether you're nonprofit or for-profit, we talk in 
an echo chamber. So how I use brands, because I don't have money to do ad spend, is I'm after their network. So like, for instance, Ford lent me a car. I paid for the gas. I paid for the oil change. I washed it. They just lent me a car. But my iPhone sunk to the Ford Motor Company website for two years posting stories of homeless people. And that's what helped validate the work, but more importantly, educate America on homelessness. Chloe says that sounds like the perfect pur purpose and reason to get up in the morning. Carol says that the socks is an amazing story. And Len Joy, a previous guest and an amazing author, says that that is a lot of socks. <laughs> You know, I was thinking about, I was listening to you and I was, first off, I was, I just can't even fathom 3 million socks. That's ridiculous. And, you know, you're so kind to give me credit for that. I mean, all I really do is try to shame a brand into doing something bigger. And so it was, that was all I did. I said, look, you know, you got socks. This guy's got people who need socks. This seems like a match made in heaven. I said, you're why I will only buy Hanes products till I'm dead, you know, because you're going to support Mark. And they were like, well, I like dead Chris Brogan, so we'll give him socks. That, that is not at all um, what they said. That's not what they said. Um, so the other thing that's kind of cool about invisible people is that, you know, it, it's weird and people would think it's weird that a homeless person would have a cell phone, but a cell phone is your lifeline. It's a chance to have a job. It's the only way to get calls back home. There's no pay phones anymore. What do you think they're going to do? Go ask, wait for the public library? So if they have a cell phone, they have bandwidth when they get to free Wi-Fi zones, which means they can watch Mark's show. And so one of the things I kind of like about the concept of making a video show for all these years, people might be like, wow, that's a lot of firepower to throw at this. But Mark, you've got something that's actually accessible to the community that you're talking about, as well as to the people who need to see it so they can do better things with legislation and funding. Yeah. Well, a couple of things happen behind the scenes. Um, first off, I focus on audience building. And that's, you know, when you have a limited budget, you have to look at and see what's going to give me the most impact. So over the years, um, audience building was what I thought, and it was a good decision, would get the most impact. We hit 675,000 subs on YouTube Hooray. yesterday. Uh, the better metric is 50 million views in the last 90 days, 93 million, 94 million in the last year. And we're projected to 140 million in, uh, the, the coming year. And we have about a hundred thousand readers on Apple news. Google news doesn't give me analytics that I know of or that I can find. And that was just really such a smart decision, but something came along the way with that. And uh, what's so interesting about live streaming, um, if you guys remember, GM gave me a car with Wi-Fi back in 2011, and I live streamed a road trip. I mean, around Canada and everything. Where there wasn't Wi-Fi, it was unheard of, right? And now it is so common. Well, as I started connecting or building influence on social media, homeless people started reaching out. And I was, oh, wow, homeless people on Twitter, homeless people on Facebook. And I tried various things that failed to build community, but we eventually, we have an online support group on Facebook for about 1,300 homeless people from around the world. Um, that has been really probably the best decision I ever have made. And then Sunday nights, we go live. Every Sunday night, I go live on um, YouTube. And what's interesting to me, I don't share. Occasionally, I'll have a guest and I, I will share on social media to try to bring in the audience, but it's really me connecting with the YouTube community. Um, and there are so many people hurting right now. There's so many people that are at risk of eviction or just they're laid off or furloughed or they're in their car watching YouTube. So many people consume YouTube that are homeless. So mm -hmm. our chat room is moderated by homeless people. And we not only is there, you know, this marketing value from live streaming, but there's also this community cause support value that we're providing. And we've been doing it for two years. And again, it's one of the best things that I've ever done. Fazia says the show is amazing. And I love Fazia because she is amazing. She says she's feeling so good and motivated. Chloe says that she remembers going to New York in 2015 and sitting with homeless people on the street. And so many said they needed toothpaste and toothbrushes to keep their teeth healthy, which is like another thing most of us who haven't experienced it wouldn't know. 
Coach Woodard says his son volunteers with unhoused people in Los Angeles, mentioned socks and underwear, the most requested items. So yeah, lots of love, lots of love in the comments. Mark wow. probably runs into uh, Coach's son every now and again out that way because that's, that's been your, in the old days anyway. And Don taught in a course on social media for social change and used invisible people as an example in the courts. Well, now, and I feel like we're going to bring Luol back in. I, I feel like we could add a, a person who's making a game that's name literally means peace. By the way, I love that you go from Grand Theft Auto to, I think I'd like to make a game about peace. Right? Um, <laughs> you could have gone the other way, Luol. You could have said, you know what I'll make? Is it even deadlier game? But... No, he's like, this will be peaceful. You'll give me your car <laughs> without arguing about it, and I'll drive away in it, and everything will be fine. Yeah, and I think that is more of uh, finding purpose, though. So, because like, if I was, if I, I first, I always tell people that I found purpose before I decided to create game. So, like, I really knew what I was going for, and 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 what cause I want to go for, and what I want to develop, and what I want to create. And 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 with that experience, is if I did not play. Grand Theft Auto, I wouldn't be a, a game developer today. If it was a different game, you know, I wouldn't like have the same experience. I wouldn't have like the so sometimes we 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 find certain things and we take granted for it. Yeah. But I think if I didn't play Grand Theft Auto, I was not gonna be a game developer. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> so both of you built business from purpose. I mean, the way yeah. uh, Mark, I seem to remember your story, but you know, my memory's got holes in it. Is you know, you were doing really well. You were a big time LA TV producer kind of guy. You were making real live shows that real humans watched. Um, and then things went a little wrong, and you ended up homeless. You got yourself back to okay, back to housed, back to everything, and then it got knocked down again. And you're like, well, here we go. Guess yeah. I'll work on this purpose thing. So you both chose the hardest road possible because most everybody else on this call for the most part said i just need to make some money for my job and you picked something that's hard like if someone offered either of you a really like if um i don't know if epic games said luel come on come work on Fortnite. you can make the next hammer uh or mark someone says you know we're gonna make this new tv show with drew carey would you take that job because i feel like i would but would you Wow, that's that's a very good question, and and and, and that's something that always make us think a lot. And uh, there are two answers to that. Uh, second to that is, if if the call is is for you to go and make like the next a, a next certain kind of game or something that is not part of your of, of, of your mission, I'm pretty sure you're not going to do your best out of that because that's not that's not your that's that's not what you're used to creating. So, and, and that alone would actually make me say, no, I'm not going to do it. I will just keep on at least scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. But if, if, the, op if the purpose is about like, hey, well, come to Epic Game, uh, we need your experience and want to create something. And then I will use my experience to be able to create something that I feel like is going to help the world with their resources. And, you know, there, there, are, two ways, there, there are two ways you can think about, but, but uh, the reality is this. I want to focus on what I love. I want to do what I love, and and doing what I love is the most important thing, and 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 that's something that is part of you. You know, our differences are when someone chooses to do something that is so purposeful. For example, Mark Mark is uh, is working on something amazing because he has experienced that. It's it's, it's 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 different from somebody else working on that project, but he's going to be doing it. There's, there's going to be that humanity. There's not going to be that humility in it because that's something that you experience and you can do the best. And and I think those are something that we always have to think about when we are making decision. Mark, there's a saying that people like yeah. to say is you know, especially in faith based communities. I was called to this. I was yeah. called to this. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're called, you can hang up the phone. I think we're forced. I don't. I don't. I, it wasn't mm -hmm. a choice for me, and I'm doesn't sound from your story it was a choice for luol mm -hmm. um and i gotta share real quick because luol is bringing back all kinds of memories as a tv producer i was uh snuck into sudan in mm -hmm. 2003 and 2005 and i can as he was talking about walking for water and walking not having power and mm -hmm. walking for power it all came in one of the stories that i uh, my first time i had never done international film okay. so i hired a videographer that had a lot of experience and i'm so glad i did because when we landed in sudan he brought candy for the toys he bought 
frisbees. He brought soccer balls and he brought like wiffle balls so we could teach baseball. And one of my best experiences was to try to, and these were generals in the uh, Sudanese People Liberation Army who yeah. have seen murder and rape and their lives destroyed. You could see the craters of the bombs all around. Mm -hmm. And we're teaching them how to play baseball. And they're just laughing and running. And for us, we know you go to a base, you're no. out. They would, they just kept running. They would hit home and we're trying to mm -hmm. draw. Mm -hmm. And there was no internet or any way that we could. This is baseball, something mm -hmm. we all take for granted. And, and it was really, 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 really amazing. Um, I wow. fight with corporate Mark. I want to be a marketer. But then yeah. I want to be yeah. this Mr. cause Mr. guy, and I <laughs> yes, fight exactly. all the time. And I occasionally, I, I uh, my last gig four years ago was chief marketing officer for a very large nonprofit with mm -hmm. fifteen thrift stores around New York State. It was a very exciting job as a marketer, and it also connected to homelessness. But I was behind a desk, and I didn't feel fulfilled. I love money; that part was great, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> but. It wasn't what I'm doing today purpose. And to directly answer your question, um, this is my destiny. Yeah. I love it. I'll I take it. I feel like one of these kids is doing her own thing up here because all three of you were like, I'm not going to work for the man. I got my own business. I got my own purpose. I'm like, I work for someone. <laughs> <laughs> But hey, I also but, have purpose. But you have lots of purpose. So I do. listen, it's time for uh, person of the day. This is sponsored by pub-site.com. Fazia Burke, FSB Associates, person of the day. Look at that amazing apple. It goes for being with an amazing person. Our chosen person of the day today is Lori Davis. Now listen, it's wow. always an apple, Lori. So it's not like, you know, when teachers get brought an apple, we give everybody <laughs> an apple. We don't even give you one. You have to go get an apple. So if you want an apple just like that, go to a store, find one. You are the person of the day. But Lori teaches high school and she wants to use Luol's game in her class. <laughs> so I think that's amazing. Yeah. So there you go. And Thank if you, you ever John. wanted to, uh, if you ever wanted to drag in uh, people like Mark to discuss homelessness, I bet you do virtual classroom stuff too, don't you, Mark? We're actually building, that was one of the goals for this year, was to create curriculum for schools. Um, we didn't get there, but uh, that is on the radar for eh. something real soon. COVID, we're not doing anything fast, no. are we? Listen, I want to, I want to, oops, did I click that? Nope, I want to highlight. I didn't touch anything. <laughs> I did it. I want to highlight Tim Sanders is here, the original hey, love Tim. cat himself, Love is the Killer app. Incredible man, written several amazing books since and works for, I forget where right now, but he's giving them his love right now. But Tim wow. is uh, Tim is one of the guys who changed my life in a way, you know, gave me the advice I needed at the right time. So he's always welcome here. And everybody's loving on Lori. <sighs> yeah, Lori's got all the love today. And Len, yeah. Joy, thank you for coming by all the time. It really we brag about you about every day now at this point. So um, listen, here's the next part of the show. Luol, you said it too. You said you can't just carry everything in a backpack. But what is different than anyone who has said this in the history of the show is you've had to live that life in that way. You could, you had to carry what you could carry. Your family, when they made that journey, mm -hmm. only had what could go in their hands. So when we talk about this, we talk metaphorically about the future, yeah. and and you know that that everything is so unsure. You've lived it in a way, and Mark has too. You know, you live in homelessness. You mm -hmm. only have what you can stash and what you can carry. So mm -hmm. this question will be different today. What goes in your backpack? Now it can be again an emotion or an, a, a command that people should follow or some rule. Or it can be something as simple as, like Carrie said to you earlier, an avocado. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's yeah, good. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. That's um, I have so many, but um, the question need one answer. I think you only can. <laughs> hey. Yeah. So I think for me, it's gonna be gratitude. 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 You know, I always tell tell people that you know, gratitude is something that level me up. It's something like keep me going it's something that that just made me forget what's around me and just keep it going being being happy being you know uh being grateful yeah and yeah i'll take gratitude that's a good one Mark. <laughs> tenacity uh tenacity of you know having the strength the courage uh the blind ignorance if you will to keep going uh, against all odds, even when it seems hard to keep going. Uh, but as a gift, I would really 
like the ability in these days to feel secure in an insecure world. Security. Wow. That is always a big one. Upwork, by the way, for Tim Sanders. I'm so sorry, Tim. I was blanking and it's like I was like super big, important company. Can't remember the name, some company. T gratitude and tenacity. I like tenacity. One of my three words for 2020 was mm -hmm. push. Uh, the verb push, which just means just keep going. Like, you know, everything's done, you've wrecked it. Just push, mm -hmm. just keep going. Um, I imagine in both circumstances, Luol and Mark, mm -hmm. um, I bet it's hard to always keep that that sense in mind of, you know, Luol, when you said people had to walk for water, mm. well, water's 10 feet away now. You just push mm. that thing up and yeah. down and water comes out. Yeah. You know, if you want um, food, uh, a, a guy in a car will drive to your house and put food in your mouth now. Mm. You know, it, it must be you hard. pay extra to have them put it in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> your guy doesn't do it. My driver doesn't. It is gonna, <laughs> there's a new startup. No. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Chris is like, I need you to peel the grapes for me and put them in my mouth. That's How right. much for that? I yeah. guess I'm saying that it must be so challenging. You know, it's it, in some ways it's easy to rest, and in some ways you can never rest. You mm -hmm. know, because Mark, you're always on the verge of everything collapsing again. Luol, you're like, you know, here by kind of all these graces mm -hmm. uh, that you don't yet control. You know, it's not your millions. Uh, yeah, you know, so it, it must be hard to sort of operate in that space. So you've You've shown such strength, both of you, for how you've done it over these years. Amazing to see. There's no question there. It's just a oh, okay. oh, okay. He's just yeah. loving on you. Yeah, He's just loving on you. Like everybody in the comments. <laughs> right. That's what we do on this show. And the other yeah. thing we do on this show is we also try to honor our elders and kind of respect where they're from mm -hmm. and really just, you know, show. So, for instance, my grandmother, uh, you know, came down uh, to USA from Canada and – 